It's time. Negligence. Part 3. Reach of duty. Continued. We talked about the general standard reasonable person. Now let's talk about the specific standards. We're going to talk about children, professionals, bailments, and owner occupiers of land standards. So first up, children. Children are not held to the objective reasonable person standard. Instead, they are held to the standard of a child of like age, experience, and intelligence. In other words, they get a standard that is tailored for them. What was not given to the defendant in Von V. Menlove, children get that. They get a break for not being that bright, for not really knowing what they're doing. Why do children get a break from the law? Well, I believe the children are our future, don't you? Doesn't really matter. They do. They get a number of special accommodations under the law. Exception. Hold on, there's an exception. Unless the child is engaged in an adult activity, in which case it's the adult standard, the reasonable person standard, the objective reasonable person standard. There's actually a lot of stories that pop up of 12 year olds, 13, 14 year olds who drive their parents' car. Maybe they take their parents' car to school. You drive your parents' car, that's going to be an adult activity. You're going to be judged by the reasonable person, objective reasonable person standard for adults. There was a story not long ago of a kid who drove their family's tractor to school. Well, you drive a tractor on the farm, that may or may not be considered an adult activity, but when you take the tractor on the roads to school, that's almost certainly going to be considered an adult activity. You get into an accident, you're sued, you're going to be judged by the adult standard of care. Now, children for and under are generally considered to lack the capacity to be negligent. In other words, children for and under are generally immune from negligence liability. So those of you in my audience who are four years old, watch out when you turn five, all of a sudden you can be held liable in negligence, but with a standard adjusted for your age, intelligence, experience level. For my audience who's five years old and above, if you're going to a birthday party where someone's celebrating their big number five, Consider giving them as a gift uh, some safety cones, a book of fill-in-the-blank waivers. It's very thoughtful for someone who has just turned the age where they might be a negligence defendant. Next specific standard, professionals. And here we're mostly talking about doctors and medical malpractice, but there could be other professionals who are negligence defendants, attorneys, nurses, accountants. Professionals are not held to the regular reasonable person standard. Instead, they are held to the standard of what would be done by a minimally qualified person in that profession. In other words, custom is dispositive with professionals. Suing a physician for medical malpractice, the theory of breach is that the physician should have ordered an x-ray. You don't ask whether the objective reasonable physician would order an x-ray. You ask whether minimally competent physicians would order an x-ray in that situation. In other words, the profession really sets its own standard of care by adopting practices. Now, the traditional rule was that generalist medical practitioners were judged by the standard of the local area where they practiced or a similar locality, and specialists were judged by a national standard. So if you're a regular doctor who's not advertising a specialty, you'd be judged by the standard of a minimally competent doctor in that town or a similar town. And if you're holding yourself out as a cardiologist, no matter where you're practicing, you'd be held to a national standard. Now the trend among jurisdictions is to hold all physicians to a national standard, regardless of whether they're a general practitioner or holding themselves out as a specialist. And at this point, a national standard for general practitioners may even be a majority rule among jurisdictions. Next specific standard, bailments. Here we're talking about a chattel, an item of tangible property that has been lent from its owner to someone else. And we're asking about what's the standard of care there. And it depends 
on whether we're talking about the standard of care for the bailor or the bailee. The bailor is the person who owns the chattel and is lending it to someone, and the bailee is the person who is borrowing that chattel or renting that chattel. So let's break it down. Got to do the breakdown. Try again. That is a that is a resilient bottle. All right, again. Okay, so here's the breakdown. If it is the Bailey's standard of care, and here we're talking about I I borrowed something from someone and I break it and I get sued because I didn't take good care of it. What's the standard that I'm going to be judged by? There's three standards here. It depends on whether I borrowed it solely for my benefit, solely for the benefit of the person I borrowed it from, or for the mutual benefit of both of us. <laughs> and this is one of my favorite doctrines because if I borrowed it for my sole benefit, then I have then it's a high standard. I have to take really good care of it. If I borrowed it solely for the bailor's benefit, then it's a low standard. And if I borrowed it for mutual benefit, then it's an ordinary standard. So if you lend me your lawnmower to mow your lawn, then I have the low standard because I borrowed it exclusively for your benefit. If you lent me your lawnmower so that I could mow my my lawn, then that's a high standard of care. If you lent me your lawnmower to mow some common area that we both share, then that would be for mutual benefit. Now, for the Baylor standard of care, here the scenario is a personal injury scenario. Generally, we're talking about someone lent me a chattel and the chattel hurts me or does some property damage. So if I lent something to you and you get hurt and sue me, how does that work? So here there's two standards. If it's a gratuitous bailment, meaning that I lent it to you for free, didn't take any money for it, I just let you borrow it for free, gratuitous bailment, then I must inform you of known dangerous defects in the chattel. So if I lend you my car and I know that the brakes don't work that well, I have to tell you about that. If it's a bailment for hire, like I rent you my car in exchange for $39.99 a day plus mileage fees, then I must inform you of known and reasonably knowable reasonably discoverable defects in the chattel. In other words, it's the same standard as for a gratuitous bailment, but we add a duty to inspect, to make reasonable inspections to see if the brakes don't work, something dangerous is cropped up with the chattel, if I'm trying to make money off of lending chattels to people.